Hey guys, welcome back. In this video, we're going to break down the second episode of the Halo TV series named Unbound, as well as going over any easter eggs and hidden details that were in the episode. So, let's begin. The episode opens with a flashback to 2530, which is 22 years prior to the main story, with Chief post-augmentation on Reach as a teenager with all the other Spartan 2s. Spartan 066, Soren 066, as bed is empty, and Chief follows him. He's escaping. Now, originally, the plan was for Chief to escape with Soren, which is kind of like what happens in the main canon to a degree, but at the last minute, Chief chooses to stop Soren and instead follow his UNSC programming. Soren wants to escape the UNSC after all they've done to the Spartans and to finally achieve freedom. He's having dreams of his past, which is why he wants to escape to the rubble and start fresh. Now, Soren doesn't seem to be as crippled by the Spartan augmentations as he is in the main canon, but still, he basically lost his left arm. The Spartan program and what Dr. Halsey had done to them had cost Soren a lot, and so he wants to escape and finally achieve freedom. The two discuss a lot of the ethics surrounding what Dr. Halsey's done and also the Spartan program, and eventually, Chief decides to give Soren five minutes to escape before he alerts the entire base to what's happened. Soren does manage to escape, presumably just like in the regular canon, stealing one of these long swords, and eventually he makes his way to the rubble. And again, this is a slight departure from the regular canon. Technically, Soren defects in 2527 in the regular canon, but this scene is set in 2530, so there's a three year differential there. Moving back to modern day, we have Chief and Quan in the Condor that they use to escape Reach, going to the Rubble, which is an insurrectionist colony in the 23 Libre system that's basically embedded within and between multiple asteroids in a large cluster of asteroids. Now, the reason they're headed to the Rubble is because Chief had the visions and the dreams that Soren had talked about all those years ago on Reach, and he wants to talk to him about them. As the two are travelling through Slipspace to get to the Rubble, Chief continues to say that he knows nothing about the artifact that they retrieved from Madrigal, and that he was not about to let the UNSC kill a child. That, of course, being Quan. Switching back to Reach, Halsey and Lord Terence Hood talk about Chief going AWOL, and they try and pin it on the artifact, creating massive energy fields and somehow affecting the Spartan. And Lord Hood notes that because the Covenant clearly put a large emphasis on retrieving the artifact, that now means that the UNSC need to move into asset denial and ensure that they don't get their hands on it. Halsey still believes that she can trust Chief, however, she will be using the Cortana program to control him, and this is the beginning of her manipulation of Admiral Parangoski to get her to kind of pseudo-agree to the project, given that in the last episode, it was clear that she was very against it. But more on that later on. Silver Team still have no contact with Chief, however, they do manage to track his slipspace travel and follow him there under the orders of Dr. Halsey. Switching back to Chief, he and Quan arrive inside the rubble, and immediately the insurrectionists that inhabit it don't trust the Spartan, until, of course, Soren arrives and confirms that he's cool. When Chief opens this door, the sound it makes is a reference to the Covenant doors from Halo 1 and Halo 2. <laughs> Soren reveals that Vincia Graf, the guy that we saw on the news channel in episode 1, and that is now in control of Madrigal, has offered a galaxy-wide bounty for Quan's head. We'll touch more on Vincia in a minute, but he was essentially a UNSC plant to gain control of Madrigal and its rich reserves of fuel sources for the UNSC. Soren expresses to Chief that the rubble allows him absolute freedom that he'd promised to the Spartan all those years ago back on Reach. It really seems like he's living his best life out there. They take a very rickety Resident Evil 4 style train cart journey to Soren's home, which is in an asteroid outside of the main rubble, and on the control panel of this kind of rickety train cart, you can see the Halo logo. Just a little reference. Now, in the main canon, even though it seemed as though some of the insurrectionists in the rubble were almost friendly with the Covenant and went as far as trading with some of the jackals, these jackals had an ulterior motive. They planned to eventually turn the rubble into a jackal nest. Maybe the show's going to use that? I kind of hope so, because it's a cool plot point, but you never know. When they get to Soren's house, Soren reveals that he has a wife and a child named Kessler making Soren one of the first Spartans besides Maria in the canon, or in any of the Halo canons, to have children. And Soren's wife says that he speaks of Chief often. We then get one of our two brief doses of High Charity, the Covenant Holy City, in this episode, where Marquis, Truth, 
Mercy and Regret, the three Covenant Prophet Hierarchs, speak with the Elite who was in the cave when Chief touched the artifact in Episode 1. The Elite, who some believe to be the Arbiter, but we don't have any evidence to fully confirm that just yet, said that the Spartan took the artifact and that when the Spartan touched it, it activated and showed him the Halo. Now, Marquis insists that she will retrieve the Keystone, which is the artifact herself, because she can blend in with humans and it would be very easy for her to steal it, unlike the Prophets, which I think it goes without saying, could not blend in easily with humans. The reason the Covenant want this Keystone artifact is because, like the Elite said, it can show them the location of the Halo Rings. However, the Prophets don't want to send Marquis in on such a dangerous mission because of her importance. She is what they refer to as a Blessed One, which is something new to this canon, and right now it's looking as if it's like a semi-retcon of the whole Reclaimer thing from the main canon. So, in the regular canon, every single human is what is called a Reclaimer, which means they can interface with and interact with foreign attack. They are the only species in the galaxy that can do that. However, it seems as though in the, in the TV show, only a select few humans have that ability. It's not a species-wide thing, and those few who have the ability are referred to as Blessed Ones. The only Blessed Ones that we know of so far are Chief and Marquis. But back to High Charity, Mercy reveals that he personally took Marquis in and tutored her on the Great Journey. Going back to Reach once again, Captain Keys reveals that Vinchagrath has control of Madrigal for the UNSC, and also control of the planet's rich sources of deuterium, which are used to fuel ships among many other things, and they also reveal that this has actually managed to reduce fuel prices across the galaxy, which is quite on brand for the modern day. Keys also reveals that they haven't found Chief yet, but when they do, they will give him adequate punishment for what he's done, but Lord Hood intervenes, saying that Chief is a symbol of the war effort, and he's great for hope and for building morale, and to punish him in such a severe way would strongly damage that morale and that hope. Halsey once again manipulates Admiral Parangoski into agreeing to the Cortana project, despite only at the end of last episode her being staunchly against it, by saying, in front of the entire UNSC High Command, that she supports it and that it can be used to control the Spartans, alleviating their current AWOL chief issue. Halsey also says that Cortana is the next stage in human evolution, with the Spartans being the first step, and Cortana being the upgrade that they need thanks to her superior intelligence. She also has to reassure the High Command once again that Chief's emotions are suppressed and that he's just bred purely to fight for humanity, not to feel or think anything else. However, one of the UNSC High Command members mentions a paper that Dr. Halsey wrote some years before about AI systems that involves flash cloning, which is an illegal procedure of which Admiral Parangoski is staunchly against. However, she can't speak up against it at the table without looking like a fool thanks to Dr. Halsey's incredible wit and wordsmithing. Before Halsey can even comment about the fact that she's using Flash Clones when she shouldn't be, Hud turns to Parangoski and says that Section 3 is her responsibility, but gets her to confirm that she's absolutely on board with the Cortana project. Now, Section 3 is a division of the Office of Naval Intelligence, of which Parangoski is the Commander-in-Chief of, that was responsible for the Spartan program, so if she's not in favour of what Horsey's doing, then she's got somebody operating beneath her who is violating her orders, which, again, if she were to confirm that that were the case, would undermine her position. We then get our first look at Vinchagrath in the flesh on Madrigal executing insurrectionists, and also lambasting their previous, now dead leader, Jin, Quan's dad, for leading the UNSC into a costly war, and also for stealing their hydrogen. But there's a drone above watching, and Quan is watching what Vincha's doing through the drone. Soren's wife, who sat with Quan, reveals to her that she also lost her family and further her entire planet to the Covenant when she was a kid. And I have a feeling that whatever planet this is, is essentially standing in for Madrigal from the regular canon in terms of its place in the Rubble's backstory. So in the regular canon, Madrigal was one of the first colonies to ever be glassed by the Covenant, and its survivors fled to an asteroid and ultimately built the Rubble there as their new home. My theory is that with Madrigal being used in a different way in the TV show, whatever planet it is that Sovereign's wife came from that she lost her family on is essentially going to replace Madrigal in that part of the story. 
And then Quan reveals that she wants justice slash revenge. As Sorin's wife notes, those two can be equated as the same thing sometimes against Vinisha and all those who kill the people on Madrigal. It then turns out that Chief can't taste the fruit that he's eating because of the inhibitors inside him from the augmentations, and Sorin and his wife start chilling and taking a drug that's called Clarity. They offer some to Quan, but she said that she's had enough clarity in the past day she doesn't need any more. Sorin says that the augmentations, the battle-focused ones in particular that the Spartans are given, numb life, but they can wear off if you don't take them for long enough. This is part of how Sorin was able to achieve that freedom that he wanted, and part of why he believes Chief and the other Spartans lack that freedom and free will, because so many of their emotions are suppressed, they can't experience life as it was intended. Before the night ends, Kessler, Sorin's son, stamps Chief's hand with a smiley face, which shows that he can trust him and that Chief can count on Kessler, and Kessler can count on Chief at any time, which is meant to be emblematic of the hope that Chief instills into anybody, civilian or trooper. However, all the while, the UNSC frigate Stalwart Dawn, which is housing Silver Team, are tracking Chief to the asteroid belt. Now, the name Stalwart Dawn is a subtle reference to the frigate commanded by Captain Keys, known as the Midsummer Knight, in Halo The Cold Protocol, which is the book that has essentially formed the foundation of the TV show's story. The Midsummer Knight was a Stalwart class frigate, and this frigate is called the Stalwart Dawn. Obviously, you can see the similarities there. Back on Reach, once again, Miranda Keys tries to convince Admiral Parangoski to let her have the magical artifact, the Keystone, when it arrives back on the planet, as xenotechnology is Miranda's field, and she's done tons of work on shielding systems, active camouflage, slip face navigation, and is even working on deciphering the elite language, and she's starting to get tired of Dr. Halsey getting all the resources purely for the Spartan program. But ultimately, Parangoski insists that the artifact will go to Halsey. Speaking of, Sorin and Chief start to inspect the Keystone, but Sorin's touch doesn't activate it. Only Chief seems to. So, they go and see Ref, a human who, in the regular canon, was in fact a jackal that was working with some of the insurrectionists, but also working with the Covenant. Now, Ref is a human, like I said in the TV show, who was captured and held on a Covenant ship, and so knows things about the Covenant and the way they operate and their religion that most humans don't. He's a bit crazy, understandably so, because, I mean, the dude has quite literally been abducted by aliens, right? And for some reason, he seems oddly obsessed with Quan. I don't know if this was just meant to make him look even crazier than he already did look, or if this is a potential plot thread that might get picked up later with Quan maybe being special as well, but I don't know, we'll have to keep an eye on that one later. Chief shows Reth the keystone, and he reveals that the Covenant's religion is all about these artifacts that were left behind, which obviously we know were left behind by the foreigners, but at this point in this universe, as far as I'm aware, the UNSC, humans, only nobody knows that the foreigners existed. When Reth was abducted by the Covenant, they apparently had him try to activate the artifacts like that on their ship, but he couldn't activate them. He also can't seem to be able to activate the Keystone either, which confirms that he isn't a Blessed One, which again circles back to what I said earlier about this canon, the Silver Timeline, possibly altering what it means to be a Reclaimer and not making it a humanity-wide trait, but instead only making it a trait of a select few humans. This is further confirmed because as soon as Chief touches it once again, it activates, it sends out a massive energy pulse, and it gives him another vision of him as a kid with that wolf, just like in episode one. However, this time, his memories of his childhood are interlaced with some memory flashes of his time training with the UNSC. Ref then reveals that Chief is different to the Blessed One that the Covenant have, which reveals to Chief and humans that the Covenant have somebody who can interact with these artifacts. This, of course, being Marquis. He also reveals that the Keystone leads to the Halo Rings, which he reveals to be a door to the end of life as we know it. He tells Chief to destroy the Keystone and to destroy himself, or he could end up helping the Covenant destroy humanity by gaining them access to the Halos. But Chief chooses to ignore him and instead returns to the UNSC on Reach with the Keystone to tell them about what it means, about the fact that the Covenant need it and how important it is, and also to regroup with the other Spartans and prevent the Covenant from getting their hands on it. As he's leaving, Sorin lambasts Chief for wanting to return to Dr. Halsey after all that she'd done to he and the Spartans when they were children, 
but Chief claps back by calling Soren disloyal for abandoning them, and then Soren claps back once again, calling Chief disloyal for abandoning him when he was escaping Reach. Chief has Quan stay behind on the rubble with Soren because regardless of the argument they just had, he can still trust him and he's the only person that Chief knows outside of the UNSC. As he's leaving the rubble, Chief activates his Condor's beacon, which alerts the stalwart dorm and Silver Team to his location, and they take him back to Reach and take him in, formally in handcuffs, and Halsey gets the keystone to analyze it. But first, of course, she goes to visit Chief in his holding cell. She tells him that she's informed Command about the Covenant wanting the artifact and about the artifact's implications, but that Chief going AWOL has created an entire plethora of problems. It's detracted from his ability to instill hope in others. His dependability has helped people feel safe and helped them feel hopeful that they can win this war, but when he's out of sync with the UNSC and defying their orders, it doesn't quite work as well. But Chief says that he felt something, referring to the memories that he sees when he touches the artifact. But Horsey very quickly moves to shut him down on that because she realizes the implications of him finding out about his childhood and what really happened to him when he was six. He told her that he had to save Quan from the UNSC's execution because he's become different thanks to those visions. He feels connected to something out there, but he doesn't know what it is or why it chose him. And this is very conveniently overlaid with footage of Marquis undressing on High Charity, and given that they're both blessed ones, Maybe that's the connection he feels? I can definitely see them building a contrast between these two characters. Like I've said before, they're on very opposite sides of the war. However, they're both instilled with this unique trait of being able to interact with the artifact of both being blessed ones. So it's clear that there's a link between these two characters. Chief continues by saying that he doesn't normally feel anything, obviously because of the augmentation, so all of this is rather strange to him, but he came back to Reach because there's nobody else that he can trust with all this information besides Dr. Halsey, given that she acted as almost a mother figure for all the Spartan 2s. And then the episode ends with Dr. Halsey about to presumably extract the brain from the Flash clone to create Cortana, of whom I have a feeling we'll be seeing in episode 3. Whether Halsey's being entirely honest about Cortana's main use in this canon being to control the Spartans and to stop things like this happening, or if it's going to be more in line with the games where the Cortana and other smart AIs are essentially there to facilitate the Spartans on the battlefield, and to be fair, like Halsey said in this episode, upgrade them and make them even more efficient, well, we'll have to wait and see. But that was a full breakdown along with some hidden details and easter eggs of episode 2 of the Halo TV series named Unbound. Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments and also if I happen to miss anything from this episode, of course, again, let me know down below in the comments. And so, I'm going to round this one out here. I want to give a massive thank you to James Kirkwood for becoming a new Primordial over on Patreon. Thank you very much, sir. And of course, to everybody else for continuing to support me over there. And thank you all so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. And I'll catch you all in the next one.